Good morning. This is Pastor Dennis Roser. Welcome to Divine Service at St. John's Lutheran Church. The members of St. John's are committed to sharing the good news of Christ Jesus, who was crucified in the place of sinners, so that everyone who believes and trusts in Him will not perish, but receive as a free gift everlasting life. St. John's is located at 1000 Bluff Street in Beloit. Our telephone number is 608-362-8595. Please visit our website at www.stjohnsbeloit.com. We are a member congregation of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Our Sunday morning worship service is held every week at 9 o'clock a.m. And we invite you to join us and receive the gifts that God delights in giving you through His Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who may heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. O Lord, we pray that your grace may always go before and follow after us, that we may continually be given to all good works. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our reading from the Holy Gospels is taken from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Soon afterward, Jesus went on his way to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd were traveling with him. As he was approaching the town gate, there was a dead man being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not cry. He went up to the open coffin, touched it, and the pallbearer stopped. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear gripped all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. This was reported about him in all of Judea and in all the surrounding countryside.
In the name of Jesus, amen. Over the years in my ministry, I've become very good friends with a number of funeral directors. Not only do we work together quite a lot, but also our vocations have some similarities. While it is true that the work that we do is quite different, at the very heart of both of our vocations is caring for people in crisis, as well as the need for absolute secrecy and what we see and hear. In both vocations, one takes to their grave, their own grave, the things that they see and hear, that they shall never breathe a word of what is shared with them in confidence, anything of a a sensitive nature. But as you know, there are a lot of random stuff that happen on the peripheral that are public knowledge and we're free to discuss. And it's interesting, all of the things, like in your vocations as well, that no amount of training can prepare you for. My favorite funeral director story was told to me 15, 20 years ago when I was first starting out by a man who was 20 years older than me. And so he had been at his vocation for a whole lot longer than I was. But we we were talking, and in the Pittsburgh area, that whole region, one of the things... uh, that is hard, you know, to explain, is that the towns and cities grew up in the time before cars were really a big thing. And and so they're built tighter together. The streets are packed tighter together. They're they're two-way streets, but you can really only get one car going sort of at a time. And especially as you go up into the older neighborhoods, many of them having cobblestone streets. And so he was telling me about once in the early days of his ministry, he was driving the hearse, his supervisor, of course, was driving the lead car. And as they snaked their way through one of the back neighborhoods there where we were serving, suddenly horrible sounds came from the hearse, smashing sounds, and it's rattling the car. He didn't know what was happening at all. It scared him, of course. And he's looking around to see what is happening, and the neighbors had come down out of their houses and were smashing dishes on the side of the hearse. Because you see, the man whose funeral this was was Greek, and they were going through the old neighborhood. And his neighbors explained To Jack later, he had no idea what was going on. His neighbors had come out and were smashing dishes against the hearse. It was their way of taking a last stand against death. And while I'm not a big fan of the destruction of property, particularly the destruction of other people's property, and as Jack said, they stopped going down through the old Greek neighborhoods after that, what they were doing was very biblical, not the destruction of property part, but it showed that they actually get it, that they actually get it, that death, make no mistake, death is always the enemy. Too many times we make the mistake of thinking that death in some way is a helper. There are books and articles, death, my friend, Because sometimes a person's life becomes so difficult and their suffering so great that when the Lord calls them home, it is a blessing. And we get confused. We get confused and we start to attribute that blessing to death itself. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verse 26, he says, death, death is the last enemy to be done away with. We dare never, ever, ever think of death as anything other than an enemy. We don't need to be saying to ourselves when death comes, well, it was a blessing. We can say that it was a mercy that God called this person home. That we can say. But that death is to be hoped for? Death is a blessing? Absolutely not. And in fact, the statement we often hear that death is a natural part of life is absolutely wrong. 
It is spoken by those who misunderstand life. It is spoken by those who fail to appreciate the first two chapters of Genesis. Because death wasn't a part of God's good creation. On the sixth day, after God creates the land mammals, and He creates man, man, mankind, male and female, He created them. In the image of God, He created them. God looks at all that He has made, and He says, not as He said the other five days, it is good. But He says, metzion, in the, in the Hebrew, it is very good. It is very good. And we discover that in that good creation there is no death. There were no steakhouses in the Garden of Eden. That everyone was a vegetarian. God says there in chapter 1 and again in chapter 2 that I have given you every green plant and every kind of tree with its seed in it according to its own kind for food. There was no death. Death doesn't enter in until chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fall into sin. When they rebel against God, when they decide we will be God, we will set our own destiny. We will call the shots. God has said of this tree, you shall not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they decide it looks good to the eye. And from what the serpent here is telling us, that it is good for making one wise. And so Eve took and ate of the fruit, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, meaning not doing his job of saying, no, we can't do this. It defies the Word of God. They plunge into sin, and death enters in. First death in history, where the deaths of the animals whom God killed to create clothing for the man and his wife, because they had so corrupted themselves, so perverted God's good creation, that they could no longer go about uncovered. We read in Genesis 2, verse 24, and the, no, no, it's verse 25. Genesis 2, verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked, and they were unashamed. They were not ashamed. Now, God puts to death two animals in order to cover Adam and Eve, so corrupted by sin that they are. And death has entered in. Chapter 4 Cain murders his brother Abel. In chapter 5, we get the genealogy of of Adam. And and as I've mentioned several, several times, so I won't go into this again, the refrain that you hear in Genesis 5 over and over again, and he died, and he died, and he died. Death enters in. And so sin, death, and the devil, they are enemies against your soul. They want nothing more than to rob you from your Lord Jesus Christ who has ransomed you back from sin and has opened to you the way of everlasting life. And so we dare never, never think of death in any other terms than as enemy in the same way that we think of sin and the devil. And so it is in the jaws of death that we find one of our main characters in our stories this morning from Luke chapter 7. Jesus and his disciples are traveling with a large entourage. People who aren't even his disciples are hanging on because he's done some amazing things. He's healed people. He's done miracles, and they want to see more. And so as they're traveling into a town called Nain, not too far from Nazareth where Jesus grew up, they see another procession, another entourage of people coming toward them. And it is a widow, it is a widow coming forth, weeping terribly, frantically, as her son, and as we're told in the text, her only son, and she was a widow, is carried on the burial plank. It's translated in in a whole bunch of different ways. Sometimes it'll be translated as coffin and and casket and these kinds of things, But but it's more like a plank that they would carry the person out of the city and they would be taken into one of the cave-like tombs that have been made. 
And so great procession of people. And Jesus shocks us. He shocks us because he comes up and he says to her, the literal translation there, you, you know, here in our English translations, the most common thing is do not cry. But actually, if we were to translate it literally, and most translators can't bear it because it sounds too rough, Jesus says to her, stop sobbing. Stop sobbing. Sounds pretty rough. But consider for a moment, Jesus is the only person who has a right to say this because he can undo this death. He has the power to give her a reason to stop sobbing. Unlike those people, well-meaning as they are, who cannot handle our grief, And you know what I'm talking about. Anyone who is grieved for any length of time, and for every person it's going to be different, and the grief will look different, knows what it's like to have family and friends who can't deal with it any longer. That maybe even sometimes friends say, come on now, you have to pull yourself together, and you need to get over this. For your own sake, for the sake of your family, you've got to pull yourself together, and you've got to get over this. As if we can simply will ourselves to heal from heartbreak. But people believe that we need to rush our grieving. Or that there's a certain amount of time that's normal for grieving. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's going to be individualized for every individual. That's the way that it goes. But Jesus can say to this woman, stop sobbing. Because of what he's about to do. He will give her a reason to stop sobbing. Immediately, he touches the burial plank, which you didn't do. You were not to have any contact with a body. These guys who are carrying the plank, they will not be in the worship of the temple until they have undergone ritual washings and a certain amount of time has been passed that they are purified. And so people don't step into that situation because that is to defile themselves, to make themselves unclean. And so we're a little shocked, maybe at face value, when Jesus says, do not cry, or stop sobbing. They were shocked. They were shocked when he put out his hand. He put out his hand and he touched a plank. It may have been carried at such a height that that's as, good as, he, as close as he was going to get to the guy on top. But he puts his hand on it and immediately everything stops. It's one of those horrification scenes. You know, when somebody's done something that everybody's jaw drops. And then what he says next is even more shocking. Young man, I say to you, rise! And to everyone's amazement, to everyone's amazement, the young man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus, Jesus gave him back to his mother. That's where the story gets a little complicated for us. We've seen in 1 Kings chapter 17, our Old Testament lesson, the raising of the widow's son at Zarephath by Elijah. We saw in another case, somebody who was hosting Elisha, the prophet that came after him, whom Elisha also did a miraculous resurrection thing for. Jesus, in John 11, a little bit later, will raise Lazarus from the dead. But it's tough for us to read these narratives. Sure, it's exciting. We think of the woman. Her life is essentially over at this point. She will have no means of support. Her husband and her son are both dead. She doesn't even have anybody to comfort her, really. In that culture, there were professional mourners. People whose job it was, was to give the person a good send-off. They didn't have the, the empty cemetery services like I've sometimes done, just me and the undertaker. But there, there was people who would fill out the ranks and make it work, but she was alone, and alone in her grief. And we see that suddenly, 
As the boy's life comes back into him, everything changes for her. We imagine the joy. But it doesn't take long, if you're anything like me, before in your heart you start to think, why her and not me? Why her and not me? Most of us who have lived any length of time know what it's like to stand over the casket of someone whom we cannot bear to let go. We know that pain. I see it every time at the cemetery committal service when the family is helping to escort the mother, the father, the husband, the wife, whatever the relationship may be, helping to escort them from out underneath the tent. And so many of them, hands clasped on the top of the casket. Because as they leave that cemetery, there is now a physical separation that has occurred. They have already felt the pain of separation when their loved one's soul has left them. But throughout all the planning, all the process, through the visitation and now the funeral, they're still right there with their loved one. They're dressed up and they're in the casket. They can see them. But now, now is the moment of separation in which they will leave the cemetery and their loved one remains. We know what that is like. At least most of us. We know the pain of that. The feeling of separation. And we think about this woman, how everything was reversed in an instant for her. Why not us? It's the same question that we ask when we see miraculous healings in the Bible or miraculous healings in our day and age. And over the years, I've been privileged to see a few. But I'll be honest with you, I have seen a lot more tragedy at the hospital than I've ever seen miracles. It has nothing to do with the competency of medical science, but the fallenness of human nature. That we live in a fallen world. Our bodies are frail, full of all kinds of shortcomings and problems. And at the end, the enemy death takes us. Sometimes it stalks us slowly over time. Think of someone with long-term illnesses. And sometimes it catches us like a highway robber that attacks us in the night and we die very quickly. But however we go, it is this enemy death. Now the raising of Lazarus, the raising of this man at Nain, the raising of of the widow's son at Zarephath, and all of the other resurrections that we see were not ends in of themselves. In the same way that the healings, the healings are never an end in and of themselves. And that's very hard to remember, especially if the healing has come to your family. And what I mean by that is that the healings and the resurrections were simply signs Signs pointing to something greater ahead. I, I use this kind of illustration with our catechism students, and I, and I used it Monday night, and, but I'm going to change up the details just to keep you enthralled. But you're traveling on the highway, and you're getting hungry. And you see, you see on the horizon, giant sign up in the air that says Culver's on it. Because see, Monday night, I, I used the golden arches of McDonald's. See, I got new material here. Stay with me. But you see the Culver's sign, and you say to yourself, I am hungry. Now, if you were to take your car and drive up to the sign, would you be able to get a butter burger? Would you be able to get a frozen custard? No. No, because the sign is there not to fulfill your need for food. The sign is there to point you to where you can get the food. The sign is normally strategically positioned in such a way that if you drive toward the sign, the restaurant will appear. And you can go in and buy your butter burger or your chicken or whatever it is you're going to get. 
The healings in Scripture, the healings we see in our own day, the resurrections, particularly this raising of the widow's son at Nain. It's not the destination. Even as much as we might want to stay there, it's not the destination. It's the sign pointing to the destination. What does this sign point to? It points to the power of God at work in Jesus It points to the Lord. You'll notice as you read your English translation, as we've been leafing through Luke, Jesus, 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 every time it talks about Jesus, uses his name. Whoa! The Lord, when he saw the woman, had compassion on her. And this compassion, the root word of the Greek word that's used there, it refers to the guts, your innards, the stuff inside. That from within the depths of his guts, Jesus felt for her. Or as we commonly say, because we have to clean everything up, felt from the depths of his heart. I don't like that. From within his guts, he felt for her. Sounds much better than his heart went out to her. Hmm? The Lord, Luke says, not Jesus, when Jesus saw her, And he might have done that. That's the way he's been going along in the whole narrative up to this point. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion. And that's when he does this resurrection. But what we are seeing, we are seeing the one who has the authority over sickness and death. That they are no match for him. It is a sign pointing to something greater. It was wonderful. It was great. But it's pointing to something greater. That the day will come when all will be raised. You look at Jesus' ministry. Some were healed, but not all. Some were raised, but not all. In our lives today, some are healed, but not all. Some seem to cheat death even several times, but not all. What we need to see in them is the power of God. It's a reassurance to us that not even sickness and death gets the last word. We want to be. We want to be in the shoes of that lady who had her son given back to her. But the unfortunate truth is that in this life, we most likely won't be in her position. But the day will come The day that is pointed to here, the day will come when the dead in Christ will be raised. And it will not be a resurrection to be followed by death. Lazarus, the widow's son at Nain, the widow's son at Zarephath, you you can go on the internet, you can Google them, you're not going to find them. They're dead. They've died again. But the day that is pointed to here is a day in which there shall never be death again. It is the death of death. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, death is the last enemy to be done away with. And so let us revel and enjoy this moment as we see the widow's son given back to her. But let us see the true sign of what lay ahead for all of us, an eternity in which sickness, suffering, and death will all be wiped out. It is. It is truly as the crowd who were gripped with fear, they were trembling at seeing all of this, but as they said, God has visited His people. And the day will come, that last day, when God in Christ will visit His people To do away with sin, death, and the devil, and everything else that harms us. And welcome us into a joy. A joy that will be greater than that woman's great joy on the day her son was given back to her. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me. In praying the prayer taught by the Savior, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening today. And may the gifts of God in Christ Jesus be granted to you by his gracious will. Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you, now and forever.